Hi all, thanks Pete. I'm Zach Wynn. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Infrastructure and Environment at the University of Edinburgh. And today I'm going to be talking about how in situ monitoring of a 3D printed steel footbridge is allowing us to rethink the structural design process. I'll start by providing a brief introduction to why in situ structural monitoring matters for engineers before introducing MX3D and the MX3D bridge, the world's first 3D printed steel bridge. I'll provide an overview of the extensive sensor network fitted to the bridge. And in this presentation, I'm gonna focus specifically on the accelerometers and how structural dynamics can allow us to estimate engineering parameters usually measured by more expensive and delicate sensors. I'll finish by providing a taste of what's next for the MX3D bridge, the research and its wider applications to structural engineering. So the market size for in-situ monitoring within the construction industry was valued at close to $8 billion in 2019, and is expected to more than double in the next five years. However, the vast majority of this growth is focused on monitoring during the construction phase, something which misses the benefits which in-service monitoring can offer for improving structural designs. The current engineering design process is linear. A structure is designed using the best available information, it's constructed, and that's typically the end of the engineer's involvement. This robs engineers of the chance to learn from their designs, to reflect on the in-service performance and improve on it. In-situ monitoring can allow us to close the loop, giving engineers feedback on the performance of their designs in-service. By monitoring structures in-service, we can understand their behavior under in-service loadings and how a change in the environment can impact the performance, lifespan, and efficacy of designs. We can leverage that information to improve the information available to designers, which in turn can allow us to improve future designs. This desire for improvement has driven the installation of an extensive sensor network on the MX3D bridge. So MX3D are a Dutch company who are at the cutting edge of what can be achieved with 3D metal printing. Their moonshot project is the MX3D bridge, a 3D printed stainless steel footbridge. It has a span of 12 meters and weighs a little over eight tons. The 3D printing process allows a radical rethink of what shapes and forms are possible, leading to what I think is a striking and graceful structure. The bridge is to be installed in Amsterdam in early 2021 and after previous stints at Dutch Design Week and the University of Twente. Beyond being 3D printed, the bridge is equipped to a wide range of structural and environmental sensors, from load cells and strain gauge to state-of-the-art video tracking and sound pressure meters. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the accelerometers as they have several unique advantages for long-term structural monitoring. They're low cost, durable, and unobtrusive. They can be fitted during construction or retrofitted to existing structures. They can be designed to last for years or to be a temporary installation, easily detached and rehomed. And they can also tell us a huge amount about the in-service behavior of civil designs. Now, the key drawback with accelerometers is that the data they produce isn't intuitive. On the screen is a sample of accelerometer data from the MX3D bridge, and it's clear we have different amplitudes as people move about on the bridge itself, but the raw data tells us little else. When we have periods of low amplitude, is the bridge empty or pedestrians simply stopped moving? Is this one person or a crowd of people? Do we need to worry about the safety of the bridge? Is it behaving as we'd expect? What we need to do is convert that raw accelerometer data into something that can be understood by engineers, estimates of the dynamic structural behavior. So dynamic structural behavior is defined through three key components. The natural frequency, so the frequency the, the structures oscillates at when excited, the damping ratios, how quickly those oscillations die away, and the mode shapes, which parts of the structure move at each natural frequency. But why look at dynamic behavior? Well, it can tell us about far more than simply frequencies and mode shapes, as a change in the structure's environment result in a change in that dynamic behavior. As the temperature decreases, material stiffness usually increases, resulting in an increase in the natural frequencies. As additional mass is added to a structure through soft furnishing cars and pedestrians, the natural frequencies will decrease, with the magnitude of that decrease related to both the amount of added mass and where the mass is located. That additional mass may also provide additional damping. The behavior of a footbridge with a crowd of pedestrians is very different to that of an empty bridge as each person absorbs and dissipates energy. Finally, any damage to the structure leads to changes in both the mass and stiffness distributions, causing changes in the frequencies, damping ratios, and mode shapes of the bridge or building. Therefore, by tracking these changes in dynamic behavior, we can estimate structural parameters usually measured by more expensive and delicate sensors. The method I've developed, called the short time random decrement technique, allows us to track these changes in dynamic behavior to the resolution and accuracy needed to understand the true in-service behavior of civil structures. In the next few slides, I'm gonna give a very brief overview of the method before moving on to how it's reshaping our understanding of the MX3D bridge. So the challenge with accelerometer data is that we're dealing with ambient vibrations. So we have unknown forces acting on the structure. In the case of the MX3D bridge, we don't know the magnitude of footfall, where it's occurring or when it's occurring. And this prevents us from analyzing the data directly as we would in a laboratory or controlled test. Instead, we can make use of the underlying statistical properties of those unknown forces to create snapshots of the data which we can analyze. 
So to create this snapshot, we'll start by taking a one minute window of the data. And within that window, we define a triggering condition, such as where the acceleration of the bridge is in a particular range. Where that triggering condition is met, we collect a five second segment of the data, such as the one shown in the bottom right of the screen. And here we have a thousand segments of data. As I've mentioned before, we can't analyze these segments individually as we don't know the unknown forces. However, if we average the segments together, the average of the force will approach zero, as the vast majority of forces acting on civil structures are broadband stochastic processes. That is to say they have no dominant frequency component. Because of that, we can now analyze our snapshot through modal analysis to estimate the dynamic parameters of the structure, the natural frequencies, damping ratios, and mode shapes. Now move the window forward through the data and repeat the process. Each window, we estimate a new set of dynamic behavior estimates, and as I move the window here, you can see how that snapshot changes over time. So what do the results of these analysis look like? On the screen, we have a longer sample of acceleration data from the MX3D bridge. And here we have a histogram of the natural frequencies of the structure over the course of that data set. The method I've developed produces several thousand estimates of the frequencies of the bridge for each window of data. And these estimates are concentrated around the natural frequencies of the structure, which are the dark lines in this plot of the results. The advantage of this approach is it allows us to quantify the uncertainty each time step for each natural frequency. If we now examine one of these natural frequencies in detail, so here we have a mode of vibration close to seven hertz. We can see in the top plot how the frequency changes over time. And in the lower plot, we can also see we have significant changes in the damping ratio. These changes in dynamic behavior come from a variety of different factors, with these large changes in uh, dynamic behavior corresponding to high amplitude events. In this case, a single pedestrian jumping at mid-span of the structure. The sharp drops in frequency, this course suggests a decrease in stiffness as the amplitude of the bridge movement increases. Alongside this, we also have smaller shifts in frequency and damping associated with the presence of additional mass on the structure, as well as the longer term trends in the frequency results, which we believe to be due to the bridge's thermal response. So what can we do with these sort of results? Well, one thing we can do is we can use it to predict the change in total mass acting on the bridge. Shown in red, we have the average load over a five minute window recorded by the load cells. And in black, we have our predictions of a load based on the changes in the natural frequencies and damping ratios. To make these predictions, we've carried out short calibration exercises on the bridge using known mass that's placed at specific locations. And this allows us to estimate the unknown factors in the two equations shown in bold. These equations relate a change in frequency, omega, to a change in mass and a change in stiffness. Through these simple exercises and extrapolation of the other nonlinear behavior of the bridge, we're able to accurately predict changes in loading on the structure. And what's more, we can extrapolate these relationships beyond the calibration data and predict how the bridge will behave at greater loading levels or different numbers of pedestrians. The cause of these changes in load are easy to understand, but the change in stiffness would temporarily a little more complex, with possible causes being changed in the length of the bridge span or the stiffness of the bridge bearings. And this is why the MX3D bridge project is so important. We can isolate the source of these changes in stiffness using the other sensors and develop techniques for measuring it on structures with less extensive instrumentation. So where do we go from here? I've only had time to touch on one example of how the short time random decrement technique is allowing us to better understand the MX3D bridge. Shown in the top right is some work I've been doing with the Alan Turing Institute at Imperial College London on updating a finite element model of the bridge to reflect that in-service behavior. This model is to form the basis of a digital twin of the structure, a digital version of the bridge that will be updated using the information from the sensor network to reflect how the bridge's behavior and our understanding of it evolves when the bridge is installed in Amsterdam. The use of different triggering conditions within the method has allowed us to isolate a wide range of nonlinear behavior, such as the relationship between amplitude of the bridge acceleration, the change in frequency of different modes, shown in the bottom left, and the changes in natural frequency associated with particular types of movement, shown in the bottom right. This work is allowing us to untangle and understand the different forms of nonlinear behavior, information we can use to improve future designs, as well as inform maintenance and monitoring of the bridge. The MX3D project allowing us to develop the tools and techniques for in-situ structural monitoring. Low-cost sensors such as accelerometers have the potential to revolutionize the structural design process. By combining these sensors with statistical methods and simple calibration exercises, we can understand the performance of structures in service, deepen our engineering knowledge to create more efficient and resilient designs, and rise to the many challenges the engineering profession faces. Thank you for your time today. Before I finish, I'd just like to thank my research supervisors, Tom Reynolds, Ian Murray, and Tim Stratford. I'd also like to thank MX3D and the many collaborators and funders of this research, with special thanks to Professor Roland Kermanis at the University of Twente for collecting the data I presented here today. Thank you again for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions.
Thanks, Zach. That was a, a fascinating presentation, and and really interesting to see how you know design matches up with you know measurements in, in service and so on. Um, so I'd encourage people uh, any questions, put them in the chat, and I can uh, come to you and we can uh, get you asking them of, of Zach. Uh, the question that I had to sort of kick things off was around you know where. Where could we use this next? So this is great uh, sort of it's a pilot project that you've done it on uh, with this work on. You know, where's the where's the big application? Is it in you know we should be putting low cost accelerometers on every bridge on every structure? Is it something we could do with big data? How do we kind of take this onwards and upwards? Yeah, so there's a whole range of different applications. We're already starting to see it for maintenance purposes. So the new Queens Ferry crossing is highly instrumented, and the hope with that is that we can detect damage as and when it happens based on changes bridge behavior. Uh, other applications we're already starting to explore are things like where we have a floor that moves more than it is expected to, how the designers are interested in knowing why that is. Is it a particular issue with stiffness? Is it how the resonant frequencies match up with walking frequencies? And so incorporating that sort of information into the next structure they design. And also just understanding how what loads structures are subjected to and how much their behavior actually varies in service because there's very little data in that, on that at the moment. So I think for the time being, it's gonna be really focused on big high profile projects and new materials such as 3D printed steel or engineered timber. Do you think, you know, if you were gonna speculate, uh, if you were sort of move outside of those uh, big high profile projects or the really you know, unusual materials, where, you know, where, where could it go? You know, instead, so, so we've gone towards you know mass market. So it's not just the niche projects that we learn from, but it's something wider. Do you, you know, do you think you could sort of speculate and think where you know where that might be? If if you take the automobile industry as an example, kind of twenty years ago we had very limited monitoring of cars in service. Now it is widespread. All new cars are fitted with these sensors, which feed back to the designs on performance. And I think that's the way the industry will go. If you can think of it from a maintenance perspective, if you can reduce the maintenance of railway bridges, extend the life by another couple of years, that's going to save you millions of pounds. If you can improve your material usage, that has potential to massively cut our carbon impact from mass housing roads. So I think as the technology continues to develop, as the big data processing, these kind of calibration exercises continue to develop, we will see it be kind of widespread and normalized. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a really exciting area. Um, a question from the from the audience, so to speak. I think Alessandro had a question about uh, applicability as well. Okay, well, maybe I ask a question. So uh, maybe we've covered this in a sense. It was to, just to confirm that these these procedures are applicable to all footbridges and not just 3D printed ones. Yeah, so this is yeah. um, what we're interested in developing is very generalizable techniques. So we've built these up from kind of finite element models, simple dynamic models to lab-based experiments. We're now working on the MX3D bridge. And the idea is having simple exercises with low cost sensors that can be applied to any structure, not just foot bridges, but road bridges, buildings, anything that has problems with movement or moves in any way. Uh, thank you. Then the next question from C Malaga. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Zach, for the, for the, for the good presentation. I had uh, several questions, but let me start with, with at least one. Um, you seem to be assuming proportional damping. Is that right? Yes, but we have been looking at ways you can pick out different types of damping from the results. Yeah, because these complex complex structures tend to have non-proportional damping, right? So, so yeah. Other other thing, you 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 mentioned that you've assumed that you have um, uh, because it's an ambient vibration sort of source. You are using a, a Gaussian uh, distribution for it's it's a no, you are assuming it's it's noise, but the, but the amplitudes that you've seen there are quite big, right? I mean, in in the time series, so that's. Are you sure that's the nature of the load? It's only environmental. Yes, we're well. We're fairly certain it's kind of Gaussian stochastic processes. Uh, mostly, why I say that is when we have kind of harmonic components to that forcing, we pick them up in the results. So we'll see kind of particular spikes where we don't have natural frequencies of the structure, but which actually correspond to the frequencies of that forcing function. And this is allowing us to kind of separate out, okay, now that's associated with an ambient forcing, for okay, example, so in floor slabs, kind of HVAC systems and things. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's great. 
Very interesting presentation. I will, I will be following up with some emails. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.